Hey y'all, new day, new verses as we continue on into Matthew 23. Today we are doing verses 24 through 28. And I can't wait to dig into it, so here we go. Blind guides, you strain your water so you won't accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. What sorrow awaits you, religious leaders and you Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. And you blind Pharisees, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly you look like righteous people, but inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Now, reading this section, all of 23, I see the different struggles and places that honestly are seen throughout the Bible, not just in places like Paul's letters to the churches or the revelation to the seven churches there. I see it also in difficulties that were had in the ancient Israelite times. I see it today now in our current times and difficulties. We have this tendency to put on this hypocritical falsehood. This, well, look at me. See, I'm, it's beautiful. And look at me right away. Instagram is a prime example of this. We do the grass is greener. Look at me. Isn't the show of it beautiful without missing what's really going on in there? And so people will be distracted by how nice and shiny it looks and miss what it took to get there. They miss the fact that they're, you know, filled with death. They may be alive, but they're very, they may be on, but they're very much dead. They don't have anything flowing from them. They're waiting for dry bones to be told to come alive. Not everyone will hold to it. There are many who are dead set in their ways against God because they want their praises in the here and now. They want the focus, the fame, the glory, the, the pleasure and love of people rather than chasing after having God say, this is my, serv my servant in whom I am well pleased. Rather than chasing after the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who has set all things right, the Father of our Lord Jesus, who sent his Son to die in our place so that we could truly live, we get into these falsehood places. We get into those moments of, well, no, see, I don't deal with that. I don't struggle with this. I'm pure. But I thought God came for those who know they're sick, not those who think they're well. And he came for those who know that we need him. That with everything else, no matter what, we need him. So I look at these verses and I see this struggle that seems to repeat itself again and again and again and again and again. I have nauseam through the generations. Falsities. This wanting to look and get the praises and the atta boys and the atta girls and the atas of everybody else rather than just chasing after God. Equating position and power and prestige to something of value and worth. But to what end? Kings die, riches fade, gold wears away just from being handled by human hands. So if everything that people like this, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those who are lost in the same Instagram minefield and TikTok minefield of, hey, look at me, rather than just enjoying the fact that they get to be. And it's curious to be, uh, to be fair and forward. I've seen some videos that are just people enjoying life. It's not about, hey, look at this, I'm the next new trendsetter, I'm the next new cool. It's just about enjoying the beauty of life, playing on the playground. And I think there's a difference between the two. I think when we're more interested in getting the praise and awe and gawks of everyone around us, that we miss that we may not be doing what God wants in the first place. The crowd is fickle. It will slip to and fro at a moment's notice. It will change its views, its thoughts, its feelings without hesitation. And a person who is leading the crowd in one moment can be sought after it. The crowd can be searching after that person's blood the next. It's not a beautiful thing. It's just the nature of a mob. It's the nature of a mass of people. Heck, even psychology understands. The higher number of groups of people you have, the lower the median intelligence because of the way we interact with each other. So if you're only interested in appeasing the mob, 
Well, then you're only going to be food for it in the end. Is that's all these people are doing. I mean, even the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Earlier, before we get into the conversation where he, he lays into them and rips their belief systems a new one, which, honestly, it needed to be opened so some air could move in. This kind of behavior, you know, why didn't they answer him about John the Baptist? Because they could have gotten the answer. He would have straight out said, he is the Messiah, if they had just been humble enough to answer the question. Well, did John the Baptist's, uh, did John the Baptist's authority to baptize come from heaven or people? If it came from the people, or it came from the world, basically, then the people would have mopped them because the people believed he was a prophet, rightly so. They would have said, if they had said from heaven, he would have asked why didn't they believe him. So the fear of the crowds and their own stick-in-the-mud nature is what caused them to miss out on so much. And we're seeing it here. This false, this dirty dish. Oh, it's clean on the inside, but inside it's filthy. These whitewashed tombs. Oh, it's beautiful and immaculate on the outside. Look at the law-abating law life that does everything written in Torah. Cool. Does it follow justice? Does it follow mercy? Does it follow faith? It's their love. Because what is it to follow the letter of the law and miss the spirit entirely? And I think we see that again and again and again. In trying to follow the letter of the law, we miss the spirit of life. In trying to read the Bible for a co like the secret code of morality or future sight or what have you, we miss the spirit of the law, which is more interested in the person, the orphan, the widow, the immigrant, those who need him. Those who seek him with all of their heart, all of their soul, all of their muchness, their intent, their will. You know, in, in Chronicles, there's a perfect example of it. The people of Israel sought after the Lord with all of their hearts, all of their beings, and they found him. That God was there with them, giving peace to the land. And how often will we have those same moments where God will give us peace when we let him, when we allow him to be God? Because this is the thing, well, how can you allow God? It's a free will thing. You have free will to chase after God or not. You have free will to say, I want the Lord to be my God or not. Me and mine, I want to always say it. I will always say, at least that is my prayer, that God is my rock and my strength. So that even when those moments of struggle of saying, where are you, God? I still hold to him. Because he is real. And even if I don't feel his presence in that moment, how could a God who is omnipresence walk off? So it's a matter of trusting. It's a matter of not being interested in being a whitewashed tomb or what other people think. It's a matter of chasing after God. I'll give you another example. David, when they were bringing the ark in, he was dancing for joy, wildly bouncing about. One second. Filled with joy about God's ark entering the city, about bringing it triumphantly home into the city he chose to put his name, Jerusalem. Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked at him with contempt because he was so jovial. Like, why are you acting a fool like this for people to look down on you? And David's like, I don't care. I will look ten times the fool if I am celebrating my Lord, because I don't care what other people think. I don't care about being seen as a whitewashed tomb or a dirty tomb or a clean glass or bad glass. I'm just glad to be used by the Lord. And trusting that he uses it all, that there are some cups he uses to display his glory and some cups that he uses to scoop away filth. God uses us when we let him. When we say, okay, I'm going to let you be God. You tell me what you want to do. You show me what you want because I need you. I don't need me. Laying down these questions, these falsehood, these fakities, so we could just be honest, coming before the Lord with the purity of us. No baggage, no falsehoods, no fakes. Just a broken person in deep need of being mended. Like a small child holding a broken toy. Daddy, it's broke. Please fix it. I don't know what to do. 
I tried to live life and it was shattered and broken and people kept kicking me and kicking sand in my face and knocking me down. And I don't know what to do. But I know that you'll see to it. I know that you're my daddy. I know you've got this. So take it. Show me what you want to do with my life and make me new. And as we read into the word, it reads us because he is making us new. It's like, well, how do you stop being a whitewashed human? Let God worry about your character. Let God do it. Set your character to him. You don't have to worry or play with these other things in the world. Just chase after him. I've said it multiple times. When we chase after him, nature of a relationship. The two tend to shake or cheer each other's behaviors, their isms, the things that are in nature to them. When we're in a relationship with God, his nature starts to change our very own. When we chase after him, he makes in us new. And so we don't have to play games of falsities or games of illusion to get people to think we're in a great place. Just be honest. Everyone knows what it's like to struggle. To say otherwise would be foolish. Because even if it's not the same kind of struggle, we all know difficulty. It may be to different scale. But if we're comparing and judging each other's difficulty scales and saying, well, I'm a more righteous person than you because I went through more crap, way to be a weed or a tear. That's not what we're called to do, remember. We're called to live. We're called to love. To move forward in what he has for us. Showing the world that he is greater. That he is King of kings and Lord of lords. That we can trust him. That we can hold to him in all things. So we don't have to play this whitewashed tomb game. We don't have to be dead bones waiting for someone to say, come alive. When God is the one saying and speaking it over us this entire time, come out. Come out, Lazarus. Dry bones, get up, breathe, live again. You are not made to be here. You are not made to fall down in the valley. You are not made to quit when the going gets tough. You are made to push on. You are made to show the light of God and the glory because he is right here in the moment. You don't have to play the struggle game. Get out of the boat, Peter, and walk. Just walk one foot in front of the other. That's all you have to do. Because God's arms are right there, already holding you and ready to catch you. Both. He is in this moment holding you, walking with you as you come to this place that seems terrifying. And already there on the other side of the gap, ready to catch you. So all you have to do is walk. Don't focus on the waves. Don't focus on the giants. Don't focus on the trials and the tribulations that the Lord said would come. Focus on Him. Rejoice when the giant seems too massive. Not because the giant is there, but because God is going to knock it down. Because this mountain, too, will be moved. And no matter what, God will make a way through. It's the very nature of who he is and what he does. He is way maker, miracle worker. Light in the darkness. He is our God. Then let us hold to him. Let us step out of these dead places. Stop worrying about what other people think of the look of the tomb or the glass. And instead just live. So that the others may see that he is God and that he will see to it. Our lives reflecting what we truly believe, that God's got us. I look forward to picking up tomorrow as we continue on, starting at verse 29, probably through the end of it. We shall see. I look forward to it. May his favor be upon you. Know that you are loved and trust that he'll see you through. Because the option is there. Trust him or don't. I'm going to trust him. Because even if I don't see a way, he does. And he's God. So I'm going to trust him because that's good enough for me. God is more than enough for me. So I'm going to let him lead. 
How about you? He'll lead. We can follow. Singing praises all the way. I'll see you then.